So hi, everyone. Welcome to ML Talks. I'm Joe Paradiso. I run the Responsive Environments Group here at the Media Lab. And I'm a longtime science fiction enthusiast ever since I've been <laughs> yay high, of course. There are some of us who can say that here in the audience. And uh, yeah, we're really delighted to, to be able to host this today. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Uh, this talk is being webcast. Anyone watching online can ask questions via Twitter using the hashtag MLTalks. And we'll take questions from our live audience and online towards the end. So again, I'm Joe. This is Ariel over here, Ariel Ekblah, who uh, runs this space initiative here at the Media Lab, this student-led grassroots organization that has totally revolutionized how we view space here at the lab. Uh, and she's going to be my co-host. And of course, we have the guest of honor in between. And uh, Neil needs very little introduction for any of you out here or online, but uh, I've, I've got a, a few background comments for those of you who may be new to Neil. Uh, Neil is a historical and science fiction author. I would say he's a hard science fiction author in, in the best sense of that word, and I guess a hard historical fiction author if you wanted to define that somehow. Um, and at MIT, we take that very seriously, right? There's a, a line of authors that get the science right. They really go to great lengths to make the science work. And Neil is, is, is one of the, the top people doing that. Um, and he's been a pioneer in really breaking ground in different genres of, of science and speculative fiction. Uh, with, uh, he began with really bioscience fiction, I, I, really breaking that open in many ways. There wasn't much around. And he wrote the novel Zodiac set here in Boston about a microbe getting loose and causing lots of problems threatening to redefine the oceans, and uh, it's a wonderful novel, but exposed a lot of this emerging biotechnology in ways that hadn't been done before. But then he went into cyberpunk and <laughs> is, became quickly one of the luminaries of the cyberpunk movement, right? So Diamond Age and Snow Crash are required reading for many of our Media Lab students, and those are Neil's formative that. books in those <laughs> days. And uh, yeah, he put his stamp very much on that genre and really defined much of, much of what happened in it. Uh, but then he uh, has got his restless spirit. He went on to redefine himself again to do historical fiction with, with a science and technology bent, uh, reinventing history as if you know, something had been discovered a little bit beforehand or some twist to something had been found, uh, starting with Kryptonaicon and, and a string of other books. Really one of the main drivers in what people would call steampunk or cyberpunk now. Lots of names for it. I guess historical fiction is probably the better one. And then he brings it all together with things like Seven Eves, his new novel. Uh, many of us have read it, a uh, wonderful book. Really talking about bringing people into space and what happens, but not just like we want to go to space to explore. We got to get off the planet in a hurry. <laughs> so, I mean, he really gives motivation to going into space and, and, and again, brings everything to a, a real peak in the book because of that. Uh, Neil also uh, embeds himself into people doing work in the front lines of this. So he's not just writing about stuff, sitting back and thinking. Uh, he's also getting in there with people that... The companies. Companies, yeah, embedding uh, himself in with companies. Blue Origin recently, uh, also Magic Leap, uh, and there have been others in the past. So yeah. he really gets in there to see what's going on. So uh, without further ado, it's uh, our honor to introduce Neil Stevenson. Thanks. Thanks. I'm hoping this can mostly be a pretty interactive session between me and these people and me and you, but uh, in the spirit of trying to get things going, I thought I would talk a little bit about, um, there's a bunch of things I could talk, talk about, but uh, given that we're here for a thing about space, I thought maybe an interesting place to go would be Seven Eves, uh, which uh, is a novel I published a couple of years ago and maybe tell the story of how that book came into existence because it's kind of an unusual origin story for a novel and um, and maybe uh, kind of an interesting thing in this or to this audience. Um, so um, I was working at um, Blue Operations LLC, which was sort of the precursor entity to um, to Blue Origin, and um, one of the things I was looking at at the time was um, the problem of that we might have an exponential increase in the amount of space junk. So, and by the way, this is, a, this is not me doing original research, it's me reading other people's stuff. Uh, but it's, um, the idea is that when you've got pieces of junk in orbit, um, sometimes two pieces will bang into each other at very high velocity and shatter and make more pieces. Uh, 
and as long as the density remains pretty low, that uh, can, can stay in hand, but beyond a certain point, you can see an exponential rise in that, and people were worried about the possibility that uh, if it got beyond a certain point that we might end up suddenly, or just overnight, with so much um, junk in space that it would effectively prevent us from, from going into space uh, until we cleaned it up. Um, and so, um, the, uh, so I got to thinking about that, and um, uh, it, it uh, I mean, that's a serious uh, topic of technical research, but it kind of started twigging my science fiction brain. <laughs> um, and um, because when I was a kid, I read a couple of science fiction books that are in the category of space arc fiction. So your Earth is going to be destroyed, and um, uh, people build a space arc, and they go into space to save uh, some remnant of civilization. And um, space arc books require really fine calibration of the disastrous event, because if it's a really quick disaster, then you don't have time to build the arc. Um, but if it's a really slow disaster, it's probably cheaper to go and do something to prevent the disaster. Uh, and so uh, it's got to be a disaster that can be predicted a couple of years in advance. Um, <laughs> so I thought, well, maybe this is one of those. Um, so I made it much bigger and had it triggered by a, uh, a explosion of the moon, which is a completely non-scientific idea that um, it's not sort of really ever justified in the book, but I made use of the fact that in this kind of writing, uh, people will believe anything that's on the first page. Uh, <laughs> and then once you've gotten more than about 10 or 15 pages into the book and laid out the logic and the ground rules of the story, then people become very stern judges of, of consistency. So beyond that, if you start breaking the rules that you said at the beginning of the book, you will hear about it. Uh, and so, um, so in the first sentence of Seven Eves, the moon blows up, and I never explain why. So we've got that out of the way, and, and they figure out that this exponential thing is going to happen in a couple of years, and then that gives me my, the premise for my space arc book. Um, so that uh, idea came about, and I kind of sat on it for a number of years, and I didn't really develop it. Well, I did develop it. I, I kept sort of coming up with different treatments, uh, you know, trying to see if people in the TV or movies or, or games would be interested in, in doing something with this idea. Um, and then um, a few years ago, I just decided what the hell. I'm, I, I, I always do this in the end. In the end, I always do the same thing, which is I just sit down and write a novel after I've exhausted all of the other possible ways of, <laughs> of proceeding. Um, and so and I thought of it as a way to um, address certain, um, certain facts about the sort of science fictional, the pop science fictional landscape that had been on my mind for a while. Um, and so I'll just list a couple of those and then maybe we can transition from there into more of a conversation. Um, one is that <clears throat> um, I wanted to, aside from blowing up the moon, I wanted, <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to, uh, to, to stay within the limits of, of known physics. Um, and so that means no teleportation, no faster than light drive, no warp drive. And what that basically means is that we're never leaving the solar system. And it's still my conviction that barring some big change, we, in our current form at least, are never getting out of this solar system. And so it's fine to create a science fiction universe with ships and aliens and you know, all of the fun stuff that we associate with Star Trek, Star Wars, all of those. But um, if you're gonna keep it honest, it's all gotta be within the solar system and probably the inner solar system. So that was one thing that I, I wanted to stick with. Um, and then uh, another thing that is true of notably Star Trek, but a lot of other, uh, I'll let you guys sort of fill in the, the blanks on all of the other science fiction universes that do this, but it's the trope where um, there are aliens of many different species, but they're all 
bipeds that are about as tall as we are and uh, basically look like us, maybe with some extra makeup, you know, or funny ears, and, um, and they speak English and um, with exotic accents. Um, <laughs> and in some cases, like Star Trek, we can even interbreed with them, which is a remarkable thing when you think about it. Um, so, um, um, and don't get me wrong, I think that's all really fun and I love it in Star Trek and, and so on, but um, you know, it's a real eyebrow raiser you know, on a biology level. Um, and so in, um, in Seven Eves, what happens is that the aliens are us. And so basically the, the human race genetically fragments into a number of subspecies that then sort of, uh, they, they develop after that for thousands of years, they're side by side. Some of them stick to themselves and they don't like hanging out with the others. Some of them are more prone to intermingle, but um, at the end of that 5,000 years, we've got that cool situation with a bunch of alien species that all speak English and can interbreed with, with, with each other uh, and look like us. Um, so that was kind of a, a second box that I wanted to check. And then the, the last one was um, what in the space biz we talk about as use of in situ materials. So the idea that um, uh, we, there's, a, even if you don't blow up the moon, there's basically an infinite amount of stuff out there that we can just go get to make things out of. Like we, we, would, we would never run out of asteroid materials um, if we decided to go out and, and start using that stuff. And so um, the, uh, you know, there's a traditional idea of, um, a lot of science fiction stories, again, notably um, Star Trek, but also Star Wars, is that uh, you've got people on a ship or a space colony um, who are going out into uh, space, which is a, uh, the kind of the, the final frontier, to quote directly from Star Trek. And um, so um, you know, Earth is the center of civilization, at least in Star Trek, it's where uh, it's, it's the capital of the universe, uh, and the frontier is the planets. And so, in this case, I was trying to flip that around and say the more plausible way that this would develop would be that um, we would use in situ materials, so asteroids, <laughs> pieces of the moon, to build environments um, to our specifications. And those environments would be very settled, organized places. It, they would be like living in Singapore. <laughs> and the, um, the, the earth below in this version becomes kind of the wild, crazy frontier um, that has to be explored and, and settled. Um, so, um, the, uh, so that was kind of the, the general set of goals I was trying to pursue with, uh, with the 70s project. Um, and uh, I have no real conclusion to come to, but I thought it might make for a good conversation starter in this absolutely in this context great great so we're going to ask a few questions up here rl and i will ping pong a little bit then we'll open it up because i'm sure there are a ton of questions that you guys have waiting um we talked a bit actually we chatted this morning about you know some people are hired to look out 100 years mm -hmm. some of the programs you've been involved in that's a very hard thing for anybody to do now in many ways and in seven eves you know you look up you know ten thousand or more years of course but you basically shortcut a bunch of things that you know, are kind of on every science fiction author's plate right now. And so this whole AI singularity thing, you know, we all have our opinions about that, but you know, that happens on a time scale of you know, maybe 20, 30, 40 years you know, before you know, a century is up. Yeah. Uh, so you basically sidestep that because they can't make computer uh, ICs of the kind we can now in orbit for some reason in your, your novel. So we can't, they yeah, can't get there and we didn't get there beforehand. Didn't want to go there. Yeah, because that would definitely uh, tweak it in, in crazy ways. Yeah. Uh, although biology, you got to the point where you know, we're able to play with our genome. So yeah. we're far enough along. Without that, of course, we would, they wouldn't have made it. Right. You right. got far enough along for that. And of course, that leads to the whole future of what race would be, right? DNA is just a, a CD's worth of editable data. 
leads and to you the can, ring. You can make it more or less what you want in this kind of a world that's coming. Yeah. Uh, you kind of brought it back in that there are the eaves and everything comes from the eaves and they have their own identity. So you kind of reinvented it. But one wonders if, if that is just something that, that is an anachronism, not something that's part of the future. Well, it's, uh, um, I, I mean, I think part of what the, the book is trying to do is to sort of interrogate the idea of race a little bit, what we mean by that. Um, and uh, so I'm trying to do that in what I hope is an, an accessible way. Um, so um, um, there, there's that. And then, yeah, I just didn't want to go into the whole AI singularity thing for that book. Um, because I already felt like there was enough going on. Um, and so uh, I made that into a cultural decision on the part of the people. You know, these people are, have to rebuild a civilization uh, out of rocks. Um, and um, and they, they have uh, records of the... Uh, the civilization that came before, which to them are sort of like uh, their Homeric epic and their Bible and their uh, Federalist papers. <laughs> and they're always looking at those and certain people and certain habits have become kind of proverbial to them as the result of that. And, uh, and one thing they've decided they don't like very much is anything that's too cyber yeah. uh, or too sort of social media-ish. There's some villains in the piece, in the, the early days, you know, who, uh, who have been led astray by that. And, um, and so they, they make a cultural decision kind of not to go there. And that, that's probably me just being cowardly and not wanting to uh, mix that in with a bunch of other stuff. I think in some way, though, we can appreciate that because I understand maybe not wanting to take on the AI and the singularity topic. We have enough dystopian <laughs> fiction about where that's going. And I think the Media Lab's now trying to put a different narrative on that, something more positive around ethics. But you did really treat social media and in some ways presaged what can happen with tribalism and the splitting up of communities on social media. And this was in 2014, 2015, well before 2016, 2017, and now, yeah. which is interesting that those social conversations are now still very trenchant. Yeah, come to think of it, you know, I think of myself as having totally missed that <laughs> and have been being totally surprised by the elections and all that, because I was totally surprised. But, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's talked about some um, in, in Seven Eves. Yeah. Oh, so many words. I'm trying not to. <laughs> not to look at. That's, uh, <laughs> Twitter is, is an amazing barrage sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> and social media. You can ignore yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> A question for you about technology and what we should be working on here at the lab. So the Space Exploration Initiative has a goal of trying to actively prototype our sci-fi future. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, we are inspired. And as I mentioned to you before, my PhD research is in some ways inspired by the robots in Seven Eves. Of the technical concepts that you've dreamed up, what would you want us to build that has yet to be built? And maybe start with Seven Eves since we're on the space topic, but oh. if there's something from Diamond Age that you still really want, what would you ask the Space Initiative or the Media Lab to build? Hmm. In that, you know, I have to say that uh, the one, and this probably isn't the answer you're looking for, but <laughs> the one thing that is totally dominates my attention right now is um, the whole problem of uh, how do you have a civil society if you can't agree on what factual reality is? So, uh, you know, and that's not a, um, unfortunately not a, uh, a hardware solvable problem that I'm aware of. Um, it's a, uh, uh, um, you know, this thing happened uh, that came out of, I think, of an idealistic view of what the internet was going to be. Um, and, uh, and it was, you know, the internet sort of was that for a brief time, and, and now that seems sort of quaint and, um, uh, and naive. Um, so, um, um, so now I'm mostly interested in, in trying to figure out ways that we could uh, restructure the social media universe in such a way as to encourage a more civic-minded kind of uh, approach to life, um, because that stuff is now completely owned and penetrated to the core 
by bad actors. Uh, and I don't know how to fix that. I mean, going even further, right, with the work you're doing at Magic Leap together with, you know, your prescience and Snow Crash, uh, there'll be a point where we can physically perceive a different reality from somebody else. If our, you know, senses are mediated by ubiquitous AR, uh, then it's not something at arm's length, which has caused tremendous damage. Now it's physically Completely what in real immersed. time we see and hear. Uh, could this be better somehow <laughs> instead of worse? Uh, well, I, I mean, the, I would say the point of, of working with, uh, with any kind of media, be it uh, AR or, or con uh, VR or conventional media, is to, to give the user something that in some way is more rewarding or more interesting than, than the practical reality that's, that's out there. And so I think, um, I mean, this is a very old distinction that, you know, goes back to Aristotle. So history versus poetry, uh, and um, uh, media gives us a way to, uh, to create not just history, but to create poetry, to create things that partake of, of the imaginary, uh, of, uh, of art. Um, so um, I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll also have uh, very practical-minded applications. Um, but uh, you know, I, th I think the ones that are, people are going to get excited about are the ones that uh, that have a more this, they're sort of poetic in the in the sense Aristotle meant. Uh, you know, not strictly realistic, uh, uh, based on some element of fancy or or imagination. Do you think Nell's primer from Diamond Age was something along those lines? And is there a a concept and like a parallel concept now for us what a primer would be? So the interesting thing about that is how many different people have uh, have decided that they want to implement some some version or some aspect of it. And I you know, long ago kind of lost uh, lost track. Um, You'd mentioned that there's been some oh, work at the, the Media Lab. lab there have right? been a dozen theses that have a primer in them. Yeah. So, uh, and um, and so, I think the important thing is is to not to privilege any one of those over any other. You know, it's oh yeah, that person's getting it right. Because what's interesting is the different takes different people have on it. Uh, some people come at it from a hardware point of view. You know, how could we build something that worked like that? Some people come at it from a performance art point of view. Uh, you know, or a software point of view. Um, so, um, I haven't thought about it in the context of the other issue I mentioned of, you know, can we agree on what's factual, but, uh, maybe, maybe we need one of those. I think, uh, there's certainly truth, there's also education, they're both, they're both related, right? And now we think education is the path to truth. But I think the question coming up now is what do we learn in our brain, and what does the cloud learn, and how do they come together? Because our brains are rapidly being outsourced. I search now, I'll remember just a few words, and I'll you know, take out my phone, Google it, and oh, that's what it is. So I don't have to remember things the way I used to, and I can also remember more, maybe. Uh, and when we have the wearable, that's gonna be omnipresent and alert. It'll be part of our brain. Um, and where we stop, where the cloud begins is, is just an intriguing thing. And that makes me think of, you know, Strauss's novel, Accelerando, where the guy has the glasses, he takes them off and he's stupid, right? <laughs> he is mentally deficient, he cannot function. And are we le trending toward a society like that? Is there, way, is there a way to do it to make it work for the better and you can still live without them? Yeah, the theory that every enhancement is an amputation. I can't remember who came up with oh, that, okay. that phrase, but... Uh, stuck with me. Um, no, I mean, uh, you know, we use technology in all kinds of ways to, uh, to get better at things. You know, I, I'm, I have clothes so I can go out into the cold Cambridge, Massachusetts winter and not be cold, you know. Um, so, um, uh, you know, um, that doesn't mean that um, you know, I, I don't look down on uh, uh, on myself for for being a weak person who would get cold outside uh, if I went out there without clothes on. Um, so um, it's just a uh, uh, you know we look for ways to use tech to um, uh, to to make things better, and um, 
the, at a certain point, we stop referring to them as, as technology. Um, you know, I think like, people have expressed this in various ways, but the one that has stuck with me is uh, technology is anything that was invented after you were born, mm -hmm. right? So, um, again, I don't know who said that. We should Google it. <clears throat> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, you know, buttons, tires, scissors, those are all technologies, and, you know, we're going to keep on making technologies. Have you seen the... Uh the hyper-reality video by Kiichi Matsuda. It's been circulating around the lab. It's a dystopian five-minute view on everywhere AR. Oh, yeah. Um, and it's set in, it's in, in Medellin. In Medellin, yeah, yeah. yeah. But the amazing part, most amazing part of that movie, for that, that short for me, is when she gets hacked and you see the real world, and it's dull. Even though you've been totally shocked by all this overload, when it goes away, it's just like you have the soul sucked out of you for a few minutes, you want it back. Um, will we be addicted to this? Is addiction even the right word? Um, the, uh, I think, you know, anything if it's used in an abusive way can, uh, can be abusive. Uh, so it's not a, um, I mean, the, the purpose of that video is to very carefully and consciously depict uh, the most uh, annoying possible okay. sort of bad use of, of immersive technology, and, and that person does an excellent job of it. Um, and the, the, what, what anyone comes away with who sees the video is that um, it's, uh, well, we don't want that, you know. So uh, if we, uh, um, you know, it's a, uh, what I see in like today's internet is that there's this constant push-pull between people, advertisers mostly, who are trying to exploit the, uh, the existing channels to, um, to put as many ads in your face and as many interruptions as they can pack in, and uh, things like uh, ad blockers and so on, and filters that, that are keeping that stuff at bay. Um, yeah, it's interesting to consider as well, there's this kind of black mirror side of AR and, and responsive environment tech and being completely immersed in these things, and yet we do see some models where maybe they are more uh, purely altruistic or beneficial things for humans, and something that comes to mind is pilots, the more they come to rely on autopilot, there's always concern that the better the autopilot gets, that's great, but then the pilots will lose some of their proficiency and not be able to actually jump in and save it, and yet there's a way to balance that, there's a way to keep the pilots engaged. In a space context, um, NASA is already looking at ways for astronauts to use VR to be connected to Houston, right? So they can have a VR headset, be trying to fix something mission critical on the International Space Station, and be getting a live person from Houston, not just giving them a checklist where you have a whole list of human factors issues that might confuse what you do, but an actual guided tour with this assistive VR technology. Things like that, rather than thinking of it solely as a, as a you know, an appendage that's been cut off, is there enough assistive tech like that that you're excited about? I mean, I think uh, a lot of the, um, a lot of what we see right now in, in the way the internet works today is, grows out of the, the fact that everyone opted for a, uh, a free model. Right. Uh, and so, um, the only way for people to make money is with advertising and other gimmicks like that. Um, I, I think if we get away from that, uh, and it's, it's related to what I was talking about earlier in the way that social media, you know, have, uh, have been, been penetrated um, by bad actors. You know, if you can get a free account uh, and you can make a bot that'll sign up for a bazillion free accounts anytime you want, then, uh, then it, it leads to a particular kind of, uh, of, of usage or abuse of the system that uh, makes it a lot less satisfying for, for a lot of the users. I've often wondered about the solution to that, if we wanted to dig on that in particular. I personally would be more than happy to pay for the services that I'm getting for free if instead of having to pay in my privacy and my data, I was able to just pay Gmail as a service. I certainly would. Mm -hmm. But then does that set up a, a bit of a have and a have-nots scenario where the 
relatively privileged among us can pay for the services and not be exploited by our data, and then the remainder are still being exploited in some way with this free data? Or is, it, is there a better economic answer that we really could go to, to a not fermium model where it's so easily exploited across the board? Yeah, I don't know. Jaron Lanier has had some really uh, interesting uh, thoughts on that topic um, in his last couple of books, so uh, you should get him up here. <laughs> I know Patty's had him many yeah, times a, from old friend of Patty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, here uh, you tend to see a lot more support for a free and open internet, uh, and people, of course, equate innovation at that level, right? Where the, you, the, there's nobody charging more for yeah. certain packets, and uh, it's all free, so you can try whatever you want. Uh, on the other hand, you have the dark side, so it's always a always a balance. Yeah. yeah. Um, in Seven Eves, you uh, created a very rich world with, uh, and, and a lot of it you only see at the end, right? These other cultures that I kind of suspected were always there as <laughs> reading the book. Yeah, they are there. In the and oceans. That's who they are. Yeah. And uh, okay, then the book ends. So you're not one for sequels usually, but would we be seeing maybe a sequel to this or a development on this? And if, we, if so, my question would be, do we find out more about the agent? Mm. Well, the... Uh, the, the overall idea was to build a, a science fictional universe um, and, um, and see what happened. And um, what, what may happen, what I'm optimistic will happen, is that um, we may be able to start realizing that universe in media. So we've got some uh, conversations going on with, uh, with Skydance and with um, Imagine uh, about uh, bringing uh, bringing 70s to the screen, and uh, you know, nothing's definite until it's definite, but um, uh, we've got uh, an exciting group of people behind that project now, and you know, I'm, I'm hoping it'll move forward and that we'll be able to answer a lot of those questions. Uh, maybe not in a novelistic sequel, but, uh, you know, but in media. So should we uh, open it up? This might be a good time. I'm sure you're, you're all waiting for questions. Laura has the... Uh, the tossable microphone. I don't know if that was a Media Lab invention. <laughs> I first saw it here with Ted Selker years ago. Um, so, any questions from the floor? I'm sure. Okay. Over here. Can you catch? Oops. <laughs> um, you asked how can we, um, I'm not sure exactly how you phrased it, but how can we coordinate our actions and do things effectively if we don't agree on facts. Hold the cube closer to your... It, your... it keeps going up and down. Yeah. Um, and I think you answered that question in Anathem, where you had the people from the outside and the people from the inside collaborating together because they had a shared goal or a shared uh, a mutual emotional connection. So even if they didn't necessarily have the same background and agree on the facts in the past, they had a motivation to solve the problems using current facts and things. So I think you answered your own question with that book. I love that book, by the way. It's a great book. It, yeah, thank you. Um, so asked and answered. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a reference to Anathem, which is uh, a, a book where um, a universe where uh, uh, You've got sort of the, all of the, the blue state book reading people, you know, are, have been herded into into uh, monastic compounds and and uh, and they hang out together and uh, and and be nerds um, and and they're sort of surrounded by a you know a, a bigger civilization that mostly doesn't care about them. And yeah, it, the book gets into how do those two how can those two groups work together. Uh, so over here, if you can toss it. Yeah. Um, so I guess uh, my question would kind of flip the Media Lab perspective on its head a little, because you know, as a novelist, the technology is is it's uh, at least as I read your stuff is is a probe for what novelists do, which is try and understand human beings, the characters you create, and sort of some problems in human nature. So I guess uh, what I'm curious is, is you, you've, you've said several problems that we need to address in technical 
you know, in, in the technical area, what we might do about, about fact, what we might do about AI, you know, the various technologies that, that make your, make a lot of your work so exciting. But what, I guess what I'd love to know is what, what human problem you're trying to investigate. Uh, if there's a program through your work or if there's specific novels where you try to get at certain aspects of human nature and, and human emotion and that kind of thing. Um, there's, um, I'm having a little bit of trouble with the, the monitor, um, so I'm not catching 100% of the, the questions that are being asked on this, this thing. Um, uh, Is that any better? That's it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Got to hold it like this, you know. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm just saying that sort of flip, flip the, the I, I'm wondering about your own process, I guess. I mean, the technology and the, and the questioning about where we're going with different machines and our affordances uh, makes a lot of your work, you know, incredibly exciting, but at the same time, you know, sort of the novelist's job is to, is, is often to probe the human emotion, the human concerns, ask, you know, qualities of human nature. Yeah. And I'm wondering what, what aspects of, you know, what, what, if you have a program through, through many of your books or if you're thinking about something now, what is it about the way human beings are interacting that's really uh, making you curious? Well, I think um, the, uh, the, the, the novel is a pop culture medium and I'm an entertainer. And that, uh, so I think it's, I, I fear the moment when I lose sight of those two facts and 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 try to try to be something else. Um, so the novel's always been straight up pop culture. Um, its purpose is to entertain people by telling yarns, and I'm my job is to to do that. Uh, so I think the first goal is always to um, to hit that objective and to uh, to tell a story that uh, that people want to keep reading and. Um, um, and that can mean a lot of different things, but like one of the things that you do need to do I, is to engage people um, on topics and, uh, and themes that, that are emotionally important to them. Um, I mean, it's partly style and storytelling and pacing and plot, but uh, the subject matter needs to be something that is of interest and uh, that feels relevant to, to people. Um, so, uh, you know, and a, a thing that I've been around a lot is technology, and so that is the, that tends to be my hook, right? And so to the extent that people are interested in space, for example, uh, well, okay, I, I can write a, a yarn about space that, you know, it'll have explosions and fights and, you know, drama and all the stuff that makes for a good story, but, it's set in a kind of technological world, and I can talk about delta V and you know <laughs> hypergolic propellants and all of that stuff, you know, as part of the fabric of the, the story. Um, so I think you know, in the best case, out of all of that comes something that that has these sort of more sophisticated uh, uh, payloads, um, but. But my approach is not to come at it on that level. Uh, it's always, there's always got to be uh, an underlying yarn and some characters. Uh, and, and if I really work hard and do my, do my job right, you know, I, I may get to some of the more elevated goals um, at the end. To jump in there with one thought, I'd say at least from my perspective, I think you have achieved a really interesting human story or character development, especially for young women. Oh, As someone reading Nell's story, and the Nell in the primary was fantastic to see her character development, and Seven Eves, it's about the women who found the future of humanity and figure it out amongst themselves. And it's not to say that that's not present elsewhere in science fiction, but it is rare. Women tend to have a very different, sometimes frankly, sex bot role in a lot of other science fiction from the 50s forward and your stories are so different, and I really appreciate that from a human, a human character development story. Well, thanks. Thank, thank you very much for the vote of uh, confidence. It means a lot. Um, so.
Charles. I love the vision of the internet, the meta metaverse vision, where it's more <laughs> experiential and uh -huh. less, less about facts, true or not. What's holding us back from having that in, in real life? From having the metaverse version of, of things? I mean, it, you know, it went in a totally different direction, right? So I actually wrote Snow Crash before we had the internet per se. I mean, the internet existed, obviously, but, but it wasn't, most people who were online were not on the internet. They were on like CompuServe or proprietary services. CERN. And, what? CERN. Yeah. yeah, so um, so in some ways it's a dated picture. It's it's more based on on sort of television. Like, okay, we've got these we've got these for profit online services. Um, what if they were in three D? You know, and, and, and what if uh, the people who ran those services were trying to uh, provide a kind of bread and circus model that would that would attract a lot of viewers, uh, a lot of users, um, and so, you know, the the metaverse is is founded on a certain kind of scarcity model that you've got the street, which is the high value real estate, and everybody wants to be on the street. There's only so much real estate there, and um, um, and that's not what happened, right? So what happened was that. Uh, we got the the web, which is I mean there's there's high value uh, uh, domains on the web, but it's mostly a a kind of free like one URL is the same as any other URL, <laughs> and so you don't have that scarcity model in the same way. Um, so so I sort of feel like I was wrong uh, with the metaverse, um, and. Um, if you really want to dig down, it comes to the fact that what made 3D graphics cheap wasn't television, it was video games. And so to, to have a metaverse, to have any kind of 3D shared reality, the first thing you've got to have is cheap 3D graphics. And the way we ended up getting cheap 3D graphics was, uh, was people wanting to play video games and that driving the cost of cards of graphics cards down to, to almost nothing. Um, so uh, so the the so what we've got is more of a, a game based economy than a TV based. I'm not sure I totally understand. So, but could we get there to the metaverse to to that style of I mean, anyone could set it up, right? But you've got to you've got to attract people to it, um, and um, so uh, so I don't know. Stay tuned, I guess. Can we get Neha over here? Good throw. <laughs> That's good throw. <laughs> um, hi, I loved Cryptonomicon and the way that you talked about cryptography and code breaking and. Um, how you explained it to people. And I, I wanted to ask you about cryptocurrencies. So I work on cryptocurrencies and you write a lot about money and sort of the way people pay for things in your future. And I'm curious to hear about what you think is going on now. And even in Reamed, you wrote about sort of the mining that was happening in games. And so what are your thoughts on, on virtual currencies and, and the future of money? Well, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of like a lot of people vaguely aware that there's a whole lot of ferment going on in that area with, um, <laughs> Um, <clears throat> with ICOs of various kinds, you know, and that uh, uh, there's a range of those from, you know, very sketchy or like maybe not even serious at all, but more like parodies of, of ICOs uh, to ones that, that seem to have more legitimacy. Um, you know, uh, I don't, like, I, I look on in amazement, um, but I don't feel myself to be uh, that in touch, you know, with that stuff anymore. The, uh, there was this moment, like Crypt Cryptonomicon came out of this moment in the 90s when um, a lot of the Bay Area cypherpunks um, broke towards money. You know, they were, they were working on all kinds of applications of crypto at the time. Uh, and figured out that um, that 
uh, you could do you could do financial transactions, um, and they got really interested in in money, uh, and um, um, so that's kind of where that came from. the uh, the current The current happenings, uh, I don't feel like I have as much of a connection to the story of, of those people. I, I kind of knew the story of the Bay Area cypherpunks, and I think that gave me a, a novelistic kind of soil for something to grow out of. Uh, and I'm not in touch in the same way with people who are doing the, the ICO stuff right now. Um, and that leaves me kind of uh, a little bit with my nose pressed up against the glass. Do you want to know more about it? <laughs> <laughs> Talk to Neha. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I, like, I, I know who to call. <laughs> um, you know, and, and now you're, you're on that list too, but, but I, just, I just haven't, I haven't decided to, to dive back into it, I guess. One, one thing, I just wanted to distinguish between the cryptocurrencies and the ICOs. Oh. We, I think a lot of the ICOs are scams. It's people kind of trying to take advantage of others and sell things that don't really have a lot of basis to them. But I do think there's something behind the idea of cryptocurrencies. I think they're really interesting. So yeah, thanks for yeah. thanks for, for clarifying the distinction. And, and I, I agree with you. You know, I heard one thing and substituted another. So my bad. Shin. Okay. I actually could not ask for a better leading question after this one. Um, so, you may want to hold that up closer so we can hear Okay, you. so a uh, great question to follow up on, actually. So I, I found like this technology discussion uh, really fascinating, um, but so far all the kind of conversations I've heard are still quite much uh, operating under a capitalistic institution. So whatever the technology we're developing, we're still on assumption it's going to be economically benefiting the rich or um, kind of separate, um, like, or draw more separations in the society. So for me, i kind of curious, is there any technology so far you can see happening or you're imagining that would actually change the political and social structure? There's a very stupid, uh, simple, example I'm throwing out there, it might be not accurate at all, is if um, brain interfaces could achieve to a certain level that people reach collective intelligence, would it change the way uh, human relationship um, and then the way uh, we connect with each other and the buying and selling you and me, if that concept is challenged, I think it's interesting to look at whether the capitalistic structure is still going to be uh, stable as now. So could some of the, the work that's going on here in the way or of... Or anywhere you saw yeah, before but, or you're in your imagination. Yeah, some of the, the kind of work that, that's going on here uh, could it create alterations in uh, the way economic systems work that take us away from a capitalistic model and toward a socialistic? Not necessarily socialistic, but something oh. else. <laughs> something else. Um, uh, yeah, big, big question, and um, um, probably, probably a, a novel-worthy. <laughs> undertaking to uh, to to answer that one, um, the uh, um, it has been um, uh, it's it's been notable to me that um, the the legs have been kicked out from under um, the left, the the economic left, uh, so. Um, like it's kind of happened slowly over a period of, uh, of decades, but um, right now, uh, people who uh, are not fans of straight up capitalism don't have a lot of uh, arrows in their quiver, uh, don't have a lot of levers um, to, to affect the kinds of changes they want to see. Uh, which is very different from, from the way it was 100 years ago or even 50 years ago, uh, where there was more of a balance um, between um, 
between labor and capital, I would say. Um, and it wasn't pretty, um, but, um, but there was, you know, there, there were kind of, uh, there was a functioning kind of labor movement um, that, uh, that was able to, to wield some, some real power. Um, so uh, it's really swung the other way, and I understand why, um, but uh, it's, it's definitely interesting to speculate on uh, you know, what, if anything, could, could replace that. Hi, oh, sorry. Um, we have a question from Greg Tucker, who's a former MIT labber. Um, he is watching, um, and he wants to know what your goal was uh, for System of the World and its two companion books. You have to speak up, actually. Oh, sorry. Um, the question is, what was Neil's goal in System of the World and its two companion books? System of the World and what? The two companion books. The two companion books. Companion books. Oh, got it, got it. Oh, so, yeah, the Baroque cycle... Uh, grew out, thank you, uh, <laughs> grew out of, um, it was an unexpected offshoot of Cryptonomicon. As I was finishing Cryptonomicon, within about space of about a week, I received two unrelated pieces of information. One was from George Dyson, who was going to be here tomorrow if he's not here already. He will be which was a, a book that he wrote um, about Leibniz and about the, uh, the first sort of efforts toward computing, uh, Darwin Among the Machines. Um, and um, it was basically that Leibniz worked on computers. And, um, and then unrelated to that, some, uh, another friend of mine mentioned that uh, he had been studying Newton and the fact that Newton ran the mint. So here I was, almost finished, writing a book <laughs> about computers and money. <laughs> and I found out that um, you know, 300 years ago, the two smartest people that we know about in the world at that time, one was working on computers, the other was working on money, and they hated each other. <laughs> and, um, and then I started looking into that era, which is a little bit of a blank page in when we learn American history, we don't learn a lot about that span of years. And, um, you know, Pilgrim's Salem Witch Trials, that's about it. Um, and it turned out to be a really interesting period of history with lots of pirates and sword fights and <laughs> other things that make for, for good novel writing. So I thought, well, how can I not do this? So I dove into that, um, and, you know, it wasn't a... As I was saying to Tom earlier, this isn't me being motivated by some grand plan to achieve a specific thing. It really grows out of telling a, a fun yarn about interesting characters, you know, and, and writing some plot. And I thought this was a good place to do that. Um, and um, so um, I don't really know if I had a clearly articulated goal. Out of that, it's not how I operate in, in general, um, but you know, I, I guess I wanted to show that, uh, that these themes that are important to us today, money and computers, uh, are old themes, and, and that it, it was possible to, uh, to tell a fun story about them. Thanks. Hi, um, so I have a question related to your work at Magic Leap. Um, I'm wondering how you see your role as an entertainer uh, in the medium of AR. How would you, how do you see entertainment um, happening uh, in augmented reality? So, um, the, uh, um, I'm the chief futurist, which is a fairly ambiguous title, and what I said at the very beginning was that I didn't want to just be a navel-gazing kind of <laughs> chief futurist, but I wanted to look for some way to actually do something. And um, um, for various reasons, uh, it seems like making experiences uh, is, is a good way to do that. So I'm thinking about ways to make experiences uh, that one can have using this kind of uh, 
hardware. And, um, you know, it turns out to be a, a quite an interesting problem on a bunch of levels because um, uh, you need to use um, basically technology. The tool chain that, that is used by the game industry is the tool chain that you need, you know, game engines and, and uh, Maya and Photoshop and you know, all of that stuff um, is what you need to use. Um, but you need to use it in a radically different way. Uh, and so none of the uh, standard uh, operating procedures of, of the game industry are directly transferable um, because the interface is different and um, you don't control the, the world. Um, you can add things to the real world, but you don't get to decide where the chair is. Um, the chair is where it is and you have to, to deal with that. Uh, and, that's hard, you know, it's a really interesting challenge. So, um, <clears throat> I, I guess my, my big picture answer to your question is that um, when new platforms come along, usually after a certain period of time, people figure out how to make money on, by pre generating content for those platforms. So in the case of movies, Turns out the way to make money is to make sequels to existing superhero franchises, <laughs> right? And so like all of the money goes to that. And um, it becomes difficult to make things that are not that because that's how you make money. And the same is true of games or for that matter even books or other, other kinds of media. And so, but when a new platform comes along there's this window of time during which nobody knows yet how to make money from it. And during that window of time, you may have an opportunity to try a bunch of weird new stuff. So that's where we're at right now. Perhaps when we have robot socialism and nobody has to make money, you can be truly creative. <laughs> and you know, music it would be completely the panacea for because great music comes with associated with money, in my opinion, mm -hmm. right? So if that broadens, <laughs> we'll see this new art form uh, blossom. It's tough because the tool chain is hard to use, right? Um, even even in a normal game production environment, it requires a lot of sophistication to use it, and. And uh, 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 as I said, we, we're now having to use it in different ways, so. When you embed with a company, what level do you engage with the, the company? I mean, do you work with the engineers? Do you develop code with them? Do you work at an application level? Uh, are you just with the board meeting on vision or is it all across the board? Uh, more the, or the, I'm more the hang out with engineers kind of person, but the, the caveat is that um, so I'll take Blue Origin as an example. Um, the, um, it's not enough in engineering just to know how to use the tools of engineering. Um, so you can be super good, for example, at writing code or at using a CAD program, um, and that's great, but actually participating in a large engineering effort has a huge sort of social and organizational and cultural component. You know, uh, you've got to uh, check in your code yeah. in a civilized way. And you've <laughs> got to, you know, uh, you, you've got to get along with, with the other people working on the project and a million other things which are not my, my strong suit. I mean, I just, I didn't ever have to learn that stuff. So in the case of Blue Origin, for example, when it became, it turned its efforts towards a more serious and focused engineering process. Um, that was the point where I was kind of like, well, you know, I can't be a responsible engineer <laughs> if I'm gonna disappear for three weeks at random intervals and go on book tours, you know. Um, and so, um, so the, the sort of, the area where I can actually be of any use is, has got a lot of the nitty gritty engineering kind of stuff to it, um, but it's before we've gotten into the realm of a serious, planned, budgeted, scoped engineering process. 
so the visionary part, but still dealing with the real technology and the real technical issues. But uh, before it actually gets down to line items in a, in a workflow. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the visionary part is kind of the easy part in some ways, and uh, the, the important part is having enough uh, of a foothold on the engineering realities to, um, to know what is a, uh, an achievable vision in a reasonable period of time. If you had to pick another domain outside of Blue Origin or Magic Leap, where you'd enjoy that early stage exploratory culture and really want to be shaping the nitty gritty with some of the engineers. Is it something like a CRISPR bio lab, a genetic engineering lab? Is it something like MIT DCI where you have computers and money? Yeah. What um, maybe what JPL to you? looking JPL? for the origin or looking for life elsewhere? Yeah, I feel like I'm so weak in the life sciences that uh, uh, you know, I wish I had learned more about that stuff, but I didn't. You know, I'm more of a, a code and physics kind of brain. So it would be quite a challenge to try to turn myself into uh, <laughs> somebody that different. Um, so uh, I guess, um, I don't know, I like building things. Um, I, enjoy, I enjoy writing code, uh, but again, uh, once the project grows beyond a certain level of seriousness and <laughs> responsibility, it, uh, I have, to, I have to sort of back away. We're very playful here. I think we could adopt yeah. you as the space initiative <laughs> space architect. <laughs> sort of well, that mascot. Does I had a question, if, uh, if the microphone can get to him. Who got, has the, the holy microphone? Or, or the hand grenade microphone? the person who, oh well. Okay. Big fan. Yeah, um, talk loud and right so, up there. Snow Crash was required reading in my MIT courses in the 90s, by the way, for three years. <laughs> um, my area here is law and technology, and been looking at Accelerando now much more closely, uh, the parts where you talk about this, basically smart contracts and um, virtual legal entities that uh, can be spun up quickly, like servers and a Docker, or some kind of DevOps environment. I'm wondering, what do you, I like the way you talk about law and technology and creatively extrapolate how it could be used as part of complex workflows. What are you thinking now um, in terms of what could be the role of law, lawyers, um, justice, as we build out these environments and especially as we look at things like the question you posed, the big challenge about distinguishing what's true, what's not true, and the role of human judgment? Um, well, actually, just two days ago, I was having lunch with a friend of mine. He was one of the aforementioned cypherpunks who now is a lawyer in, in New York <laughs> practicing crypto law. And um, so, um, so, yeah, the, um, um, I don't know, the, uh, I've, I've been reading a book um, whose name I'm going to forget um, because I can never remember these things, but it's a culture of fact. Um, Barbara Shapiro. Sorry, I just have a little latency in the, <laughs> the name buffer. You need uh, the wearable. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's about, um, I'm reading it because it's about fact, the idea of facts and where that idea came from, because we didn't always just have that idea. And um, so she tells the story about how uh, she traces it back to the judicial system in England where you had these traveling judges who would go to communities to address crimes that had taken place maybe weeks or months earlier. And so you can't just walk into the crime scene and like finger somebody and you know, it's not that kind of scene at all. You, there's no evidence you've got to have an algorithm, you've got to impanel a jury, uh, you've got to um, then find witnesses and, and you've got to impose certain rules like this is where we get no hearsay evidence and a bunch of, all of the machinery that we have now sort of emerges from that tradition and it's, um, you know, it's a very carefully thought out algorithm 
that they use to establish facts um, that were remote from, from their, their own perception. In other words, this happened three months ago. I'm a judge. My job is to find out what happened. I can't just throw up my hands and say, I don't know. I have to produce an answer. You know, here's my algorithm. And so um, she goes on to talk about uh, how the um, elements of this thinking and this process then got picked up by other professions. So starting with history, people who wrote history prior to this tended to be quite poetic. And you know, like Herodotus will jump from pretty straight up history to ridiculous myth, like in the middle of a sentence. Uh, and that was considered normal then because that's part of what historians did. Um, and that starts to go away as the historians begin to, um, to, sit, to say, no, this is not what we do. We have to be like judges. We have to look at the evidence. So they're using judicial terminology and judicial style procedures in order to, um, to write better history. And then she goes on to talk about how similar things happen with the early royal society and their procedure for examining evidence and deciding what is scientific fact and people who wrote about, who wrote travel logs. Um, and um, so, um, um, so it's a highly recommended read, you know, about how law and legal procedures and legal thinking um, became uh, really pervasive and really important outside of just law and in science and uh, history writing, you know, and th that all then flows through. You know, if we have histories that uh, people agree on as being legitimate historical, you know, accounts of what happened, then, you know, we can base uh, intelligent decisions upon those histories. Um, so it's not an answer yet, but it's sort of a, a, at least a slightly less depressing kind of, yeah, it, it, it suggests that we were once in a state where we didn't have a way of, of deciding on facts and we, we sort of managed to climb our way out of that. And, and so, A Culture of Fact by Barbara Shapiro. Great book. Thanks. This is so critical in the judicial context, and interestingly, it makes me think of a New York Times article that I think is number one most popular on New York Times Online right now by Fahad, one of their contributing editors, around the beauty of returning for a few months just to print newspapers and oh, yeah. facts that yeah. are determined slowly, deliberately, well-researched in a similar context in which a judge might do it, and the beauty of getting off of the instant notification news cycle. Yeah, yeah, so. Um. Yeah, so it's been like a couple of years now since Project Hieroglyph. Can't see the can't see the cube. You got yeah. Okay. <laughs> is this is this good? Yeah. All right. A couple of years since Project Hieroglyph, and you know the role of optimism in science fiction in helping society tackle big problems. Yeah. And I was wondering, like, given like a five year retrospective, how you like what kind of an impact you felt that project had? Well, I don't know the. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it, 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 so he's referring to a, a project that we ran with uh, um, Arizona State um, to, to produce an anthology of optimistic science fiction. Um, and um, so the, uh, um, and so a number of science fiction writers contributed uh, stories to this, to this collection. And, um, uh, Oh, particularly of interest here is Cory Doctorow's story, which is about 3D printers on the moon. So, um, so to that is totally worth checking out if you space geeks haven't seen that one yet. <laughs> um, so, um, but um, you know, I, I think it was. Uh, I think some there were some good stories in it. I think uh, it was an opportunity to kind of go around and raise that issue and talk about it a little bit. It's hard to trace results from it. Um, you, know, you never know. You never know what the results of these things are. But I feel like there was a little uptick in, uh, in, in people being more conscious of, you know, why, is, why are they always dystopias? You know, can, we, can we please get away from the dystopia thing for, for a minute? Um, I mean, the effects on young people, too. I see my daughter's in middle school. 
Yeah, they're reading science fiction, all dystopia. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's easier to write a story. There's obviously something there that's a conflict. Uh, there's yeah. a drive, but uh, you wonder about, about the effects. We were talking about E. Doc Smith earlier, right? right. <laughs> it was kind of a crazy space utopia, being a space opera. Yes. And that was when it started. It wasn't that dystopic. Tradition. Or the wells may have been dystopic in many ways. Of course, I mean, time machine, war of the worlds. <laughs> Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so I work in human factors, human-machine interaction, and uh, situations where the machine works beautifully, the human is sane, and when you put them together, things go terribly wrong. Um, you do that narrative and, and talk about that very compellingly, more compellingly than most people I've ever read. It's one of my favorite things about your writing. So a lot of us actually work in that area, and we live in a world where that type of drama is more and more important and more and more common. Can you give us some advice on how to talk about that narrative and how to uh, help the world understand how important it is? As a scientist... Uh, which narrative? Just the, the narrative of you have a human and a machine and the, and the interaction between them is, oh. is uh, something important and that should be looked at closely. This can be called human factors, human-machine interaction. I work in human-machine trust. Oh. Um, but these themes run deeply through your writing, and you're very good at making them compelling and uh, interesting. As a scientist, I work to make both my grant committees and the people who I disseminate my findings to, to understand that. And I know many of us do. Many of us work in that space. Well, I got it easy compared to you. I can just write that they have this user interface, you know, that does this, that, and the other thing, and and you know it's awesome. Um, it's um, <laughs> you know, as, as you know, and it, as anyone knows who works in UI design, actually making a UI that works, you know, and that works consistently for a lot of different human beings on different hardware and different conditions um, is amazingly hard. And you know, even if even if you think you've got something dialed in and working really well, you know, if the processor gets busy or there's the memory is full and it slows down the responsiveness of a, of a widget um, by a fraction of a second, it just blows everything to hell. Um, so I, I guess from what little I've seen of, of actually trying to do this as opposed to just uh, making stuff up in a hand wavy fashion in, in books, it's really, the, the devil is really in the details of, of figuring out how these tiny little micro interactions work uh, and how you, well it is trust, your, your word trust really is the key to it because if, if one time you try to pull the menu down and it doesn't come down, it, it destroys your, your trust and your expectation that the menu is what it purports to be. You get confused. Um, and, you know, I see this all the time with people who are not as computery and when the, the UI is glitchy or slow or doesn't do what they expect, it, it all goes to hell. Yeah. Uh, I work with autonomous vehicles, cyber defense, and in your books, uh, a lot of the drama you build is out of these types of interactions, actually. Well, sorry, I... Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. I said uh, in your books, uh, the type of drama that you build is often out of things like autonomous vehicles, robots, uh, you know, human-machine interaction. Well, the, I, I think that um, um, a way to, uh, to sell the, the realism of a fictional world is to get into some of that nitty-gritty stuff a little bit because it's something we deal with all the time. Uh, living in a technological society, um, and um, so uh, the the um, you know the the limitations that that we face on technology, the the surprising, frequently bad surprises that happen when something goes wrong, or there's some human error involved, um, or something just breaks. Um, you know, we've all been there, we've all had those experiences, and um, and so, in a fictional setting, I think one, you know, like, just, I mean, trick 
for lack of a better word, that I can use as an author is to, um, to include moments where the system doesn't work perfectly or uh, it's slow or somebody makes a mistake or something breaks because, as I said, we've all been there and it immediately feels like, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, that that's rings true. That's what would happen. Yeah. Talking about UI, I mean, as far as we can look in UI, we do a lot of it here, are implantables. And uh, in Snow Crash, you didn't like them very much, it seems. Right? They were the agents of the evil Sumerians to mind control people. Um, but of course, you know, it's been many years since, and that's looming ever closer. And you talked about you know, the network being based around video games. What would the network based around implantables look like, perhaps? Or you know, is there an upside to it? What, what do you think about this? Or do you think it will not happen? Implantables really, to me, gets us into a, a space that a lot of people uh, are uncomfortable with. Um, so I don't know. I, uh, I know a few people who've done it on a small level, like implanting chips in their fingers or whatever, um, you know, for various purposes. Um, uh, the, um, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I see why that's a super important thing to think about here at the MIT Media Lab. Um, I think the, um, uh, I don't know, I have to, to ponder that one a little harder because you know, anything that modifies your body is immediately gets you into a cultural space that is sort of weird or, uh, you know. Uncanny uh, Valley or something. Yeah, and, um, and um, so that's not necessarily a fair judgment. Um, but, um, but you're definitely making a cultural statement. Yeah. When you get even a small tattoo uh, or a piercing, uh, unless it's a nice, normal ear piercing and you're a girl, <laughs> then it's fine. But any other piercings, you know, you've, you've sort of culturally you've stepped over into uh, a kind of a different space and you're kind of making a statement. Um, Except if you're deaf and you have a cochlear implant. I mean, when yeah. it's a prosthetic, it's another story. And as those develop to the point where they can do other things, that's another, yeah. another kind of a slope. Yeah, well, there is that, yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know, it's a, like, it's a fascinating topic. I don't know if I can do justice to it. Two things that come to mind that might interest you on that regard. One is Janin's work, some of the work by one of the new faculty members at the Media Lab, looking at implantables under the skin. There's a new clean room here basically being, building a facility to be able to do some of that development in-house. And then Hugh Hare's work with prosthetic limbs and the bionic man and human 2.0, question being once his limbs, and they're already so close, if not already surpassing this, less energy to use a prosthetic limb to bound than the energy required for a natural human body. When do you choose to self-amputate? Because it'll right. give you an advantage yep. over that, just yeah. being something that replaces functionality that you once had. So choosing to, yeah. to do these. Yeah, if it gives you an advantage and what you really want, yeah. So, okay, so let me back away from what I said a minute ago to that I wasn't thinking of disability type situations. Um, that's, a, that's a different category of stuff, but voluntarily changing a normal body um, to enhance it or whatever is, uh, gets us into a, in seven eves, though, that happened, but I think it happened prenatally, right? So they didn't choose themselves. It was chosen for them. It was chosen for them by, uh, yeah, by, Laura. yeah, each, each of the eves gets a free one, gets <laughs> to choose one genetic alteration that she thinks will um, make for a better human future. So, Hi. Go ahead. That, go ahead, Margaret. So speaking of extremes, um, I wanted to ask the one-way ticket question for all of you up here. Um, exploring space is really breathtaking, and we feel that. Um, just wondering, would any of you take a one-way ticket, and to where, and under what conditions, and why? Kind of an open-ended <laughs> exploration question. You stole my final question for Neil, which oh, is wow. going to be, would you go to Mars? And if yes or no, give us the answer as to why. If you want to take that first, and then Joe and I could answer for ourselves. 
Sure. Um, the, the more that I looked at space, um, the, more it's, the more I was confronted by the reality that it would be, at least for the foreseeable future, a pretty unpleasant place to be. Uh, certainly if you're in zero G, uh, <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, if, if you're in zero G and exposed to radiation all the time, which is true of almost all people who've ever been in, been in space, um, you know, that is, uh, that is bad news. And um, it's, uh, um, um, so, um, and it's gonna be that way for a long time. It's gonna be like, um, you know, living in a corridor at Port Authority <laughs> oh boy! Uh, oh, the best. That's an image. <laughs> That's a yeah, best. So you're not going to be drifting, looking at the Crab Nebula, and you know it's it's going to be pretty gritty, and uh, and you're going to have to be underground a lot because of cosmic rays, and um, you're going to be confined to a space that might not smell so good, uh, and eventually that'll all get better, and we'll build great big huge uh, floating space colonies. Um, but um, um, I don't know if I would take a one-way ticket if, if I'm gonna end up in one of those environments until I die. Right? <laughs> to me, there's, there's not enough payoff to, to justify that. Maybe, maybe later when we have really pr pretty places to, to go that smell nice. I would go. I would, go. I would go. <laughs> so I thought about this for a while, and I'm already calculating the years to when I think NASA will open up recruiting for 2030s, 2040s astronauts, and will I be too old at that point to be able to do a manned Mars mission, say? One-way ticket is a, is a hard choice. I really love the verdant green Earth. People who know me know that I have like 30 house plants in my apartment mo at the moment, so that would be hard to, to give up family and give up a life here, but I think that's part of what makes us human and something really special about us is that we want to explore, we want to go push the final frontier, and I would absolutely go. I think you, you both have great points. I mean, I tend to agree with Neil, but anything we do to the planet on our own pretty much is not going to make it as bad as any of the places we can get to, right? Venus is just terrible, uh, inconceivable. <laughs> yeah. Terrible, yeah. terrible planet. Yeah, terrible. You, don't want to, you don't want to hang out there for uh, <laughs> milliseconds. <laughs> And Mars, you know, we can live inside of caves and stuff like that. There's radiation, there's no air, there's, you know, no air we can breathe. Um, we have to build it it's to cold, be It's cold, blah, own. blah, blah, blah. So we're living in the tunnel, basically. We go to a place like that. Mm -hmm. And I think unless you have to, you don't want to spend a whole lot of time in these environments. Uh, I think the deeper question, if you look at, you know, eventually people going on Mars into space, right? Technology evolves, and I think there could be a time when something leaves. What will it be? Will it be anything we recognize as human? Humans aren't built to live there. And if you look at the skills of modifying ourselves, it's about the same time scale as going into space. And the singularity stuff, if you believe any variant of that, that's all kind of coming at the same time. So what goes into space probably won't be us as we know it. And the next, that leads to my last question for Neil. Where are the aliens? <laughs> I mean, uh, you'd think that, right, if life is plentiful, they've been doing something we can notice. Even though even the solar system, they do something. Um, or are they just, you know, doing VR and uh, buried in their magic <laughs> leaps, <laughs> they don't care. Um, it seems pretty clear that there aren't any. Yeah. I mean, Cold? yeah, but I mean, uh, it just, uh, it seems like a really, really, really simple explanation of the observable facts is that there aren't any, yeah. right? At least any, doing things that we think they would do, right? Mm -hmm. If we change ourselves, we, they could be doing things we can't even conceive of. Or they could have self-destructed, in which case there, there aren't any, you're back to that. Or they just never were made. Yeah. But yeah, there's that one thread of hope that maybe they do something that, that we don't know. Space is boring. It's just stuff. I mean, I love it. I'm like Ariel. I mean, I was born to go and I love this stuff and blah, blah. I applied as an astronaut, I did all these things. And you know, we, we have our hopes with you. But uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's now. If you wait, you know, 50, 100 years, you know, the time scale when everybody could go, you know, realistically into space, we won't be the same organisms necessarily if we're still here. Yeah. 
It is interesting to think about this paradigm that we have that any time we send an organism currently out into space, it has to be surrounded in an Earth-like environmental yeah. bubble, right? Air, certain temperature, We love water. your, your plastic, nested plastic bags, by yes. the way. Yes, like oh, Tesla, talking about that a lot. living yeah. in the Yeah, in the not mine, bags. totally, but... Not no. that I want to hang out in one for a while, but <laughs> it's a great solution. Yeah. yeah. But how do you flip that? How do you not have to send humans always up into that, into space in an Earth-like environmental bubble? Can you instead make humans, ourselves, or organisms more space tolerant? Mm -hmm. And for anybody watching the live stream who's going to tune in to be on the cradle tomorrow, which is a big space event being held at the Media Lab, we're going to talk a little bit about some tardigrade research being done here at the lab in cryptobiosis, trying to take a genetic property that would make organisms more vacuum, desiccation tolerant, more radiation tolerant, and create a new wave of organisms, eventually humans, very, very far in the future. I mean, there's kind of also true enlightenment. So what we've been able to figure out from just being on Earth has been amazing. If we just augment ourselves a little bit, if not progress more, we're going to be able to figure everything out probably by staying here. And then why do anything? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's a question for Joey, I guess. Yeah. We bring enlightenment into the... Into the yeah, I do think that we're confined to the solar system. So what, yeah. barring huge, huge changes in biology, we are never, ever going to get out of the solar system um, in a significant way. I mean go a little bit outside the solar system, but we're never going to go to other stars. Um, and so that, if that's true of other alien species, it would explain quite a bit about why we don't see them, but it doesn't explain everything. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, we'll find a lot out, I think, in the next decade or two. It's going to be an exciting time as we start getting these observations from robotic spacecraft back mm -hmm. about uh, the nature of life and, and where it is or where it isn't. Yeah. So on that note, this has been wonderful, Neil. Great to see you back oh, at the thanks. lab. You're welcome anytime. We hope you're not a stranger here. Yeah. Oh, and, no, uh, it's good to be here. It's been, been too long. <laughs> so. oh, well, we'll fix that going forward. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, thanks. <laughs>